Welcome everyone. I am Erin Zimmerman, Executive Manager of IAP2 USA. Um, we are thrilled to have you all here today um, for this exciting educational opportunity. Um, and uh, on behalf of IAP2 USA and IAP2 Canada, um, who are partnering together, um, we have um, folks from from all over today. So very excited to, about the turnout and everyone that's here um, to participate and listen and learn. Um, today's webinar is made possible uh, by our generous sponsor, Stephanie Roy McCallum. Thank you for helping make this free educational opportunity available today. Um, the topic, crossing the divide in times of polarization, um, is certainly one that is very relevant in um, today's times. and something that you know we're seeing across um, you know the globe and in our communities and in our backyards and um, so I think it's a very um, relevant top um, topic right how do we handle and manage um, polarized conversations and polarized times so Stephanie um, comes with us with a array of experience. She is a facilitator, a coach, a trainer, and a leader of um, very difficult conversations. And she's the author of a recently released book, Leading Together, How Brave, Honest Conversations Can Transform Our Lives, Organizations, and Communities. Um, so welcome, Stephanie. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items because there are um, many of us in, in this virtual space today. Um, if you have questions, we um, encourage you to um, share those, especially the really juicy ones as they come up. Um, so please put those in the chat box. We will be keeping a close eye um, on those and um, have made sure to uh, reserve time at the end of today's session um, for Stephanie to be able to answer um, those questions as well. Um, you know, we do encourage you probably to keep your um, computer on mute during the, the presentation and, and workshop, but um, certainly Stephanie is a very um, engaged facilitator at her core. And so I look forward to spending um, today with, with her and with all of you. So with that, Stephanie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Erin. I am so glad to be here and I'm so glad to see names I recognize and new names of new friends and new people um, on the list as well. So I want to acknowledge territory. I'm located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. Settlers also know this place as Ottawa, Canada. So that's where I am today. Our topic is crossing the divide in times of polarization. And I'm gonna pull a few stories and experiences out of my book, Leading Together, that that Erin referenced. Um, I'm not gonna give you all the answers because we have an hour together. So um, probably take a little bit longer than that to deal with polarization. I wanna invite you to just sort of take a couple deep breaths and settle in. This is an hour you've reserved to learn more, to reflect, to, to consider some real challenges we face in our work. And I would ask you to just think about your motivation for choosing to register for this webinar. Our intentions matter so much in public engagement. And it's important that we take a breath and step back and consider our own experiences, our needs, our reasons for participating. You can put your motivation, you know, what drew you to this conversation into chat, or you can just reflect on it on your own. You know, why was this a thing you needed to say yes to on January 17th? Um, just to kind of check in with yourself. It's like a start of a brave, honest conversation with yourself. I wanna offer a quote I came across a couple of years ago that makes me pause and reflect every time I go to design or lead a conversation. Being heard is so close to feeling loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. And I like to ask myself when I bring people together into conversation, you know, what will people experience? How will they feel when they leave? We use the word so often in our work, we want people to be heard. I, you, know, you know, we want people to feel heard. Um, but are we creating spaces for them to feel loved and worthy 
and like they matter. I think those are different kinds of conversations where we can check the box on being heard and write a what was said report or where they can walk away feeling like they matter and like they're important. I will tell you honestly that I have struggled with despair and burnout over the last decade in doing this work as polarization has has increased. You know, my work is in the space of high emotion and conflict. And sometimes it's been really hard. I have wondered, is there actually a way forward? I, I wrote my book um, as, a, as a bomb or a solace to myself, but also as a call to community, a call to action to work together to cross the divide. I want to read you a quote from the beginning of my book, that it's so easy to be against things and so much harder to be for something, to build something up even when it's difficult and uncertain. I want connection, deeper understanding, trust and strengthened relationships in the organizations I work in, in the family I am part of, in the communities I live and work and play in so that we see, hear and understand each other. I wanna be part of a movement that sparks a desire to see the humanity in each other so we can heal our rifts, divides and fractures. And so we can solve the complex, difficult challenges we face. And so that's the sort of why I wrote my book. I wanna invite a space of sharing, gratitude and possibility for the next hour, a space of connection and learning. Now, just so I don't forget, um, at the end, I want to let you know, here's how you can um, find out more about my book. But I also want you to know I'm raffling off two copies at the end of this. So if you want to be included in a draw for those two copies of the book, I've posted it into chat. And you can go there as you listen along as we go through this and just enter, make an enter and I'll, and I'll send you a copy of the book if your name is drawn. So this webinar, I'm gonna cover a couple of things. This pivotal moment we find ourselves in, how to cross the divide, give you some tangible tips, strategies, and tools, and hopefully along the way also build your capacity to bravely lead challenging conversations. Um, I have spent the last 25 plus years working in high emotion and conflict. And so I hope to share a couple of examples that might be of service to you. Um, and if you've got big juicy questions um, at the end, just you know about more examples in more sectors or more areas that apply to your work, just pop them into chat. I also wanna note, just to make expectations super clear, that there are no checklists, worksheets, or top 10 lists that transform conflict in times of polarization. <laughs> this is big, heavy work that took a long time to be created and it'll take just as long to address. So just a note to, on expectations, you won't walk away with all the answers at the end of this hour. So let's start here with this moment that we find ourselves in. And I wanna do a little bit of an exercise. So we're gonna use the annotate tool. If you've signed in using the Zoom app, then this will be easy for you. And if you've signed in from a browser, I'll give you instructions on how to complete the exercise as well. So just a reminder that it, to annotate, you go to the top of the screen where you see that it says you are viewing Steph's screen. And then you click, there should be a little drop down menu and you click that. And one of your options right here circled in red is annotate. When you click annotate, a separate sub menu comes up. It's this picture along the bottom and it gives you a whole bunch of options. I want you to pick the stamp feature and choose a stamp. There we go. I can see some people are drawing on the screen. That's awesome. Yep, we got some stamps going. That's great. I'm gonna, if you found the stamp, I'm gonna get you to hold on the stamps because we'll have 161 stamps on this page. So if you haven't found the stamp feature or you can't find annotate, then that's because probably you've joined from a Zoom browser. And so when I give the exercise, you're gonna put your answers into chat. You can still answer the questions, but you're gonna put your answers into chat. So I'm just gonna clear the screen Everybody stop just for a moment, stamping on the page. Hold on, and I'm gonna to go to the page where we're really gonna use the stamps. So I'm clearing the screen and I'm gonna just move us forward one 
slide. There we go. Okay, so there's six statements on this screen. And I want you to choose the statement which is most true for you. What are you experiencing when it comes to public anger, polarization, division, disconnection? Which statement reflects what you're mostly experiencing? So put the stamp on the one that most reflects that. And if you don't have annotate, put the number into chat. And so we can see where most people are landing. And I'll just give it a minute. Thank you very much. Throwing it into chat. It's a wonder seeing all those stamps show up. So we're getting lots of stamps on a mix of all the above, but we're getting lots of stamps on one, two, and three. A um, couple of folks are sitting in no change for me. It feels the same as it did five years ago. Now that could be that it's really positive and that's the focus of the work you do, or it could be you are already in that place of polarization. Lots of people sitting in is present most of the time, or you sometimes experience it in more controversial projects, or you can feel the increased tension and reactivity. I want to thank you for, for just reflecting on your experience. You know, a thing I, I would notice that sometimes it can just feel anecdotal, right? That our feeling is that things are trending towards polarization or the divide, but maybe it's just a feeling you have, or maybe it's just the kind of projects you're working on. But I want to offer that it turns out it isn't just a feeling. So I'm just going to Re clear the screen. So hold on your stamps, clear the screen, and I'm going to move on to why it's not just a feeling. There we go. I want to share with you some evidence and some data about what is really happening. So there's an increase in something called effective polarization around the globe. So that's not just polarization, that's like polarization on steroids. And so effective polarization is where I align myself with a group of folks who think similarly to me. I feel connected, I feel a sense of belonging, um, I feel a sense of rightness, sometimes even righteousness. Um, so I think back to the trucker protests that took place in Ottawa a year ago. And one of the things that struck me whenever I watched the, the news or the media coverage is that people were interviewed and asked, you know, what's the experience been like for you? Why are you here? And over and over again, they said, well, we've got each other's backs. We're supporting each other. We're in this together. We're never leaving. People have been so kind. We're taking care of each other, right? What they're speaking to is a sense of belonging, a sense of connection. And so when that's present, I then, if this is me, I then look over at others who I disagree with. And I think that I don't just disagree with them, but that they're wrong. And by extension, they're also bad people. So it's not just the topic or the issue then that I think about. I think that actually the enti their entire being makes them bad people, but it started with just disagreement. In fact, I might even extend that to think that they could cause me harm, that they're a danger or that they're my enemy. All the emotions we experience escalate, the divide increases. And, um, you know, it becomes, you know, think cancel culture, right? You are a bad person and I want you erased. That's the effective polarization. Align ourselves with a group and then extend to think that others are not just have a different viewpoint, they're bad people. Now, there's also been um, uh, at the same time, this growth in distrust. And so when there's distrust and polarization, when you put the two things together, um, we have something really awful that happens. So this comes from the Edelman Global Trust Barometer from 2022 and 2023. But that, for example, 30% of people, only 30% of people would help someone that they disagree with if they were in need. Only 20% of people would be willing to live in the same neighborhood of someone that they disagreed with. Only 20% of people would be willing to have them as a co-worker. And that's just if we disagree with them. So you see that major extension of, you know, I don't just disagree with you. I think you're a bad person and I don't want anything to do with you. Now, there's been a rise in loneliness and disconnection. The World Health Organization has identified loneliness as an epidemic 
So people become further marginalized and isolated. And then of course there's a rise in mental health challenges. Now, also from the Edelman Global Trust Barometer, there is a distrust in government and media and government and media are seen as driving division, heightening distrust. So almost like there's a failure of leadership in those organizations that are contributing to the divide and contributing to polarization. Democracy is on the decline around the globe. There's a rise in populism and extremism. Now this content comes from a think tank in Scandinavia called Freedom House. Now, there's also a rise in autocracy, people who are less free or not free at all. And I have sometimes been asked, well, what does democracy have to do with our work in public engagement? And, and here's my answer, public or community engagement is actually the demonstration of democracy in action in society. And public or community engagement also presents the opportunity to rebuild trust. So it is integral to this moment we find ourselves in. Now, the World Economic Forum produces a list of the greatest risks facing humanity um, every year for the next decade. In 2022, this was their list. It's the first time actually the work we do ended up on this list, that the fourth greatest risk facing humanity in the next decade is the erosion of social cohesion. That's the divide, polarization, disconnection, outrage, and more. And the challenge is we can't solve the challenging problems we face. We can't cross the divide if we can't talk together. So now that I've been Debbie Downer and you're all in despair, I wanna offer that there is reason to hope. So while all of those things are true, it's not just a feeling in your work, there is division, and there is also a yearning for connection. There is polarization and there is also a yearning for change. And I wanna give you an example. I led a session in November with participants on a project I'm working on in California. We had a participant attend who said something like, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, I'm tired of government representatives coming to my community to practice their active listening skills. And she used the air quotes where they come to, their, to my community and they nod their heads, waiting until it's their turn to speak. Instead, I want them to come to my community and practice deep listening, where they sit and listen to understand our lived experiences, our values, our hopes, our challenges and concerns until that understanding is in their bones. Then they can speak. Then we can talk together. You know, you can feel the boundaries, the call to action in those statements, but you can also hear the generosity and the invitation, the yearning to be seen and understood. Like that quote I gave you at the beginning, you know, not just being heard, but feeling loved. All of these things are present in this moment in time now. It took about a zillion decisions, choices, actions to get us to this space of polarization. And so it will probably take about a zillion decisions, choices and actions to create new systems, structures and ways of working together to undo this. Um, I'm just gonna place a link to the, the organization that that participant comes from. It's a really great example. So of that quote I paraphrased for you, it's a really great example of an organization working together in a community to make change and inviting something different from government. I see we're still stamping on the uh, on the slides. That's great. We'll just have lots of little stars and check marks as we go. So I want to offer to you that I have a fundamental belief, and it's the basis of all my work, and it's the foundation of my book too. That brave, honest conversations are how we solve the problems in our lives, our organizations, and our communities. But it's not just that brave, honest conversations help us solve our problems. It is that the conversation is the conduit itself to deeper understanding, increased connection, stronger trust, and better relationships. And when those things are present, we can solve any problem. When those things are not present, we can do just about nothing. I think it's time to make different choices, to get different results. 
I, I like to think that a crisis is a horrible thing to waste. That's that pivotal moment we find ourselves in. It's time to center humanity in our conversations. It's time to meet that yearning to be seen, to be understood, and to be part of the solution. So this is why you signed up. How do we cross the divide? So I want to share four things. Um, how we build community capacity to talk together about difficult, difficult things, how we work with complexity, how we build your competency as a leader of brave, honest conversations, and how we have the courage to talk ab about high emotion and to work with emotion in this space. So let's start with community capacity for brave, honest conversations. Now, I just wanna start with the premise that no one is born knowing how to talk about challenging emotional things. No one is. And yet we expect community to have the skills to come together to do exactly that in polarized situations. And we expect that over and over and over again. So I wanna give you an example. Let me take you to a place called Denman Island. It's located on the traditional unceded territory of the Pentlodge people, including the Comox, Gliaminen, Qualicum First Nations in the Gulf Islands between Vancouver and Vancouver Island. I was invited there by the Denman Island Reconciliation Committee. It's a group of indigenous and non-indigenous community members working together on a variety of issues, things like climate change, reconciliation, affordable housing, access to clean drinking water, and more. One of the things they had found was that conflict was escalating among community members within the community, that emotions were running high, that relationships and trust were frayed, and the community was splintering. And some, in some cases, they couldn't even talk to each other about everyday things, you know, when they ran into each other at the, at the local store. Now, this is a beautiful place in the world. There's approximately a thousand residents and they're made up mostly of retirees and artists and environmentalists, outdoor enthusiasts. It is a passionate place, really committed to protecting the environment. It is also a very whimsical place where all of the watch out for deer signs on the island have wings. Someone has gone around and painted wings on them. It's just, a, it's magical. And the community meeting hall is a beautiful great room made out of local timber. Now, after a lot of discussion between me and the committee, they originally wanted me to come and facilitate the conflict that they were experiencing and help them find a way forward. Instead, we agreed that I would train the community to talk together to resolve their own conflict. And then I co-facilitate a community forum where we transform the conflict on a couple of key issues. So people were invited to be part of something different, to be part of a learning experience where they grew their own capacity to lead themselves out of the conflict. And I like to think, you know, what if we redesigned our engagement processes to center our capacity to talk together at the forefront? And then we talked together about the issues. It changes everything and it makes the divide smaller. Now I do this on just about every project I work on. Let's build community capacity to talk about these hard things so that we can talk about these things over and over again. I wanna give you uh, another example and I wanna encourage you to do this on every project where polarization and disconnection looms for you. And I don't think I pushed the button to optimize the video. So hold on one second, I'm just gonna, Reshare my screen. Okay, yeah, I did. All right, and so I wanna give you just another example from a totally different project, totally different topic, where I worked with all of the stakeholders to build their own capacity. Now, you can do it in the way I showed you on Denman Island, right? Bring people together when we had a couple hundred people participate um, and build their skills to lead these conversations. Or you can, you can do it through workbooks and videos and workshops as well. So I'm only gonna play a minute or two of this, but this is for a different conversation, preparing people to participate. Hello everyone, it's nice to be with you again. 
This video is really focused on preparing yourself for important conversations, the things you need to think about, the things you need to do, the ways of being you need to consider to, to actually set yourself up for success in important conversations. I want to start here. Oftentimes we, you know, run from one thing to the next thing and then race in to our conversations. It's so important that we just take a couple of minutes to prepare ourselves and to think, Okay, so you get the idea, right? Videos produced, community stakeholders, community members, they watch these, they answer some questions, they come to the meetings better prepared to participate with more capacity. So that's one thing that allows us to cross the divide because it builds not just our skills to lead these conversations, it builds the skills of the people in the conversations to have the conversations. All right, so let me go to thing number two, complexity. Another thing that's going to help you cross the divide, you know, in our work, in our work in public and community engagement, we have often focused on building our skills to make complex issues really simple, like breaking things down into plain language and bite sized chunks and simplifying issues so everyone can understand them. That's important. However, it's always a caveat, especially in this space. However, when we simplify too much, we create the potential to increase or escalate the conflict. We make it easy to pick a side and cling to it, and we make hard problems look simple and easy to solve. We increase the divide when there's too much simplicity in the space. So let me, let me go deeper and explain that to you. Remember this game from your childhood? Um, it's a game called Red Rover. It's where you have two Sides, I'll tell you, this was my least favorite game as a child. It resulted in hurt bodies, hurt feelings. And so there's one side in a field and people hold hands really tightly. And then there's another side far away from them. And at one point, and they're doing the same, they're holding hands really tightly. And one side calls the other side over and someone from that side runs as fast as they can and tries to break through to the side. And, you know, there's this big space in the middle between the two sides. I think how we define the sides impacts whether we can close the divide between them. Have we defined that one side is good and the other side is bad, one side is right and the other side is wrong? You know, what is our intention? I asked you at the beginning, what was your intention for joining this webinar? What's our intention when we have these sides, when we identify that they're present? Are we calling people to join our side? Are we trying to persuade or convince them to change their side? Are we trying to make our side so strong the other side might collapse? What if instead we set an intention a letting go of our side and stepping into the field between the two sides and working to see deeper understanding? A little bit like Marisol Cantu from the Richmond Listening Project talked about, deeper listening. There's a, a quote by Rumi that always comes to mind when I think about the field between the sides. And then the quote is, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And that's what we want to invite in crossing the divide. Not which side are you on, but can we stand in the middle and meet each other there? So just to get really practical and tangible, how do people change their minds? Well, <laughs> not easily, especially when effective polarization is at play. So ideally, they change their minds through a combination of understanding and experience. Now, both those things fall in our realm as engagement practitioners, right? Creating the space for the conversation, meeting in the fields for a different experience of sharing and learning away from our sides. Now, there's facts, there's evidence and data. Those stand alone. But then there are our values, our lived experiences, our perspectives overlaid on top of those facts. They become our truths and our truths can be different on the same topic. There's my truth, there's your truth. And if as engagement practitioners, we do our jobs really well and create the space for deeper understanding and new experience, it could be a shared truth we move forward with. Now. Um, 
we need to increase three kinds of complexity in order to create the opportunity to create that shared truth. So contradictory complexity is where we've got different worldviews and perspectives than our own. And we wanna create deeper understanding of those views when we, especially when we see them as the other side that is not ours. We wanna work with cognitive complexity. So that's our nuanced and deep consideration of all the issues and facts related to a topic that go beyond the ones we know or, or the ones we like, right? We'll go, we're gonna reject the ones we don't like. And then we want to increase complexity of social identity. That's who we're talking to. Okay, so let me make it really super practical and tangible. I'll give you some examples. So increasing complexity looks like this. It looks like deliberating together, taking a controversial, challenging issue and framing it. So by framing it, I mean like a picture frame, what's the conversation focused on? So people can consider the same issue from multiple angles. So I'll give you an example. I've been working with an NGO for the last year and a half. And the members of the NGO, they're an assortment of farmers and food producers, animal welfare advocates, researchers, vets, retailers, government reps. They work together in collaboration. So using consensus to come up with codes of practice that ensure humane treatment of farmed animals. So that's a little bit technical, but just think humane treatment of animals on farms, okay? In recent years though, they've hit an impasse that is threatening their years of work together in the organization. And the topic is fur farming. So that's like mink and fox, animals raised for their fur. Now, I have simplified this example for the webinar, but we took that issue where conflict was rising and we broke it into five possible ways forward for deliberation. Now, there's not a right or a wrong option, right? There's not a good side or a bad side. There's just five ways to explore so we could move forward. There's everyone participates, but we respect individual needs and values related to fur farming. There's everyone toes the line and we have strict adherence that you have to support all, all animals that are farmed, including animals that are farmed for their fur. We could explore gradual change over time. We could explore other systems and other places for insights, or maybe there's a whole other way we haven't thought of. You bring people together and you work through each option, not saying this is the answer, just some people are gonna prefer different answers. And in the end, the answer starts to emerge and it's often a mix of the different options. So that's a deliberative process or a deliberative form, but you can think about things like scenario planning or workshops, but it's an example of breaking down a challenging issue and inviting people into the complexity and away from the sides rather than inviting them into simplicity and so they cling to a side. There's other ways to invite complexity. We can invite difference. So we can ask questions that ask more of people, like how might others who think differently than you do see this issue, where we acknowledge their needs and we ask them to think about the needs of other people. We can create opportunities to be in relationship with the other, right? The people that they see, whoever they are, as bad or wrong, or you know, when, we, when we're connected to the people who think like us, as, as dangerous or even harmful. So we can do things like storytelling, neighborhood mapping, or human library, or listening projects like the Richmond Listening Project. Now, I wanna give you an example of an exercise you can do, which is the neighborhood mapping reference I just made, to create opportunities that increase um, our I, social identity complexity. So I wanna give, um, I wanna give uh, credit to a colleague of mine, Azabuke Akaba, who taught me this exercise that we've used in workshops to create connection and increase this complexity of social identity. So in this exercise, you ask people to tell the story of the place they grew up. Take, ask them to take a piece of paper and draw a mental map thinking about where they grew up that had the most significance for you. So did you grow up in a rural area or an urban area or so even a military base? And we asked them to draw, jot down the images that come to mind. Are there geographical features? Are there places where your friends lived, where you went to school, where family members were? 
draw your neighborhood or the area where you grew up in. Now, if you grew up in lots of different places, pick one that most first comes to mind. Try and document environmental amenities like fresh food, trees, access to nature. Document social places of connection, parks or churches or community centers. Document also environmental hazards like roadways or gas stations or factories. Document places of disconnection or where your safety might be at risk. Ask everyone to take a couple of minutes and make a quick sketch. This is not like major artwork. And then you get people together. You put them in small groups, pairs or small groups, and you ask them to share three questions. And I'm gonna pop these questions into chat so that you have them. And you can go back and refer to the rest of the instructions when you watch the recording of the, the webinar. But you ask them three questions. How did the place you grew up in affect who you are today? What elements of your neighborhood were most influential on your own development? And how supportive of you, your well-being, your health, your safety, success were the places you grew up? I can tell you from experience using this exercise, it cracks open conversations about diversity and equity, and it opens our eyes to totally new ideas. It increases the complexity of our social identity and we deepen our understanding of talking to people. So those are a bunch of ideas, tangible ideas, I hope, to increase complexity in your work. All right, let's go to thing number three um, and talk about your competency, your competency to bravely lead challenging conversations. And so first I want to define a competency. So a competency is a skill, right? The things we do, knowledge, which is our understanding often underpinning our skill, and also our ways of being, the ways in which we show up with each other. It's that distinction between being heard and checking the box and feeling loved, right? The ways of being that we show up create those transformational experiences. As leaders in these polarized conversations, we have huge opportunity and just as big responsibility. So I wanna read you a quote from, from my book that I think really highlights um, what's so important in how we show up in the ways of being. I've learned that how you show up and what you stand for matters most in these conversations. Not your knowledge, your role, or your position. Not your answers or your technical details. The energy and emotion I bring to this conversation impacts the space. So think about that field between the sides. Can you be loving and kind when others are full of rage, anxiety, and rigidity? I can tell you from experience <laughs> that is hard to do. Can you set boundaries with a generous heart when others are rolling with chaos and fear? Can you invite people to find their feet in discomfort and fear and stay long enough to seek the meaning and the wisdom the experience represents? Those are ways of being and they make the difference because when we're centering people in our conversations, we're seeing them, we're understanding them. Like Marisol Cantu talked about, we get in our bones what they have been through and what matters to them. Now, oh, I'll come back to that in one second. Now, you need doing, you need doing competencies, right? So those are the actions that we take. That's the embodiment of our skills and actions. That's stuff like facilitation skills, knowing how to assess conflict, you know, being good at communications to invite people to a different kind of conversation, knowing how to design methods. We need the things we do that matters as practitioners. But we also need being, the mindset, beliefs, and ways of being that support performance and results and contribute to relationship, trust, and connection. Think about what I said at the beginning with a decline in democracy and a growth in distrust. Well, actually, we need authenticity, transparency, courage, humility, and empathy. We've got too much emphasis on doing, we get stuff done, but we often create transactional relationships, losing trust and cooperation to efficiency. If we put too much emphasis on being, on the other hand, 
we get strong relationships, we maybe have deeper understanding and we build trust, but we don't get a lot done. We don't grow progress or results. So you need doing and being to gain the benefits of brave, honest conversations. I have a PDF list of the competencies of doing and being that serve you to bravely lead these conversations. And I'll send that as follow-up to, to this webinar. All right, I wanna go to an exercise. So um, I, I wanna do an exercise that is a, is a thing I do every time I bravely lead a challenging conversation. So I'll explain it first, and then I'm gonna get you to do it. So, so first, I ask myself three questions in order to set something I call a stake. And so it's called a stake because I want you to literally think of a giant wooden stake pounded into the ground. And that, so that ground is, you know, that stake is sturdy, it can't move. And I want you to imagine that to the bottom of that wooden stake, tied to that stake is a, a rope. And that rope can be as long or as short as you want it to be, but that rope is tethered to your ankle. And so literally a stake grounds you and pulls you back. When, as my grandmother would say, <laughs> everything goes to hell in a handbasket, when, you know, everything goes off course, when, you know, things are not what you were expecting, which I will say is the norm in challenging conversations, especially polarized conversations. Nothing ever goes according to plan. And so I ask myself three questions. How do you want to show up? What are you committed to? And what impact do you want to have? And I take those three questions and I turn them into one sentence, thinking about the people who will be in the conversation, thinking about the, the situation, um, what I could expect to happen, what emotions what might be present, what I'm in service to. And so I'll give you an example of what um, stakes look like. So here's three examples of stakes I have written for previous sessions. When I'm loving, open-hearted and generous, committed to growth and learning, the conversation expands with possibility. So you see how I wanna show up, loving, open-hearted and generous, what I'm committed to, growth and learning, and the impact I will have, the conversation expands with possibility. So now I'm gonna ask you to think about a future conversation, a challenging conversation you need to have. Could be at home, could be with friends or family, could be in your work environment with your team, could be with a community or a stakeholder group. And I want you to set a stake for that. So I've put the questions into chat, three questions you ask yourself, and then you take those three questions and you smush them together and you create one sentence. And then you, um, you, you, well, I'll tell you what I do. I write it on a post-it note. So here's my stake for this session. And I put it in my pocket so that when things do start to go sideways, I just have to reach in my pocket and touch it and remind myself, what am I committed to? How do I want to show up? And, and what impact do I want to have? It grounds me and brings me back every time and allows me to bravely lead these conversations. So I'm going to give you just a moment. Let's just take one minute. See if you can form a stake for an upcoming conversation. And then if you're willing, pop it into chat so we can share that. You've got mine for this session. It's the first one, when I'm loving, open-hearted, and generous. And so I'll just give folks one minute. See if you can formulate a stake for an upcoming conversation. And then we'll move on to the next thing. Steph, do you think you could go back to the previous slide that just shows the, the structuring of the sentence? Yep, right here. When I am, this and this. So that's the, how do you show up? Committed to whatever you're committed to, this happens. And can I go back to the sentence structure for putting the questions together? That's the examples, Mark, like this. The questions are in chat, the questions I ask myself. Yeah, okay. And those are the examples, yep. Yeah. I'll just give it another 30 seconds just to see. Ah, oh, beautiful, Sheila. Calm and prepared, committed to deepening connection, dialogical learning and relationship building happens. 
curious, committed to people's genuine interests, understanding happens. Oh, fantastic. I exhibit a balance of warmth and competency. I work respectively and effectively. Oh, those are beautiful, just beautiful. Oh, thank you so much for sharing folks. And so imagine if we did this every time we had to bravely lead a challenging conversation. If we stood in this, if we grounded ourselves in this and then we showed up to lead these conversations, it makes an enormous difference. Oh, Jane and Penny, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for so much for sharing everybody. All right, so I wanna move on to the last thing. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and I wanna save a couple minutes at the end for a couple of questions. I just want you to know that if we get close and I don't get, end up answering very many questions, I am committed to, to responding to a sampling of them after the webinar. So I will I'll put, write, a, you know, write up some answers or I'll do a bit of a video responding to questions and just in case I don't get to yours. All right, so let's talk about thing number four the courage to embrace and work with emotion. And so let's start first, and then I'll just be truly honest, this is my life's work, but it is so much easier said than done. And I want you to think of the last time you were uncomfortable, like the last time someone did or said something with emotion that pushed your buttons, and then you went right from discomfort to them being wrong. Like it happens to all of us. It's a common human reaction. As soon as we're uncomfortable, we make the other person wrong and we make our feeling of discomfort right. We look to validate why we feel the way we feel. So let's talk about discomfort for a second. And I'm gonna give you a tangible example. I have been working with IEP2 International for three years now as co-lead of the development of a new global learning pathway. So that's 13 courses and a global curriculum of training. They'll be launched in various places in 2023 around the globe. The team I've worked with has spent thousands of hours developing, consulting, refining, engaging, considering and creating all the new courses. Now, that doesn't mean there haven't been deep moments of discomfort. And most of those moments, to be truly honest, has come when we've gotten feedback and input on the curriculum, just like anything you do and you put your heart and soul into, when people have comments, sometimes they're hard to hear. Now, much of the comments have been constructive and made everything so much better. But some of the feedback has been directed at us and our team personally, calling into question the integrity, the approach and the process. It, I'll be honest, it's been hard sometimes and sometimes hurtful and pretty much always uncomfortable. And so rather than giving in to gut reaction of being right and others are wrong, as soon as we're uncomfortable, we have sought to stay in the tension and ask ourselves, what's going on here? What can we learn? What do we need to understand? What is being offered to us? And I'm gonna copy those questions because actually I think they're questions everybody should ask themselves when they become uncomfortable. Now, some days we did really great staying in the tension of the discomfort. Some days, not so well, just like everybody. We work to be curious and open, but sometimes we were frustrated, hurt, anxious and overwhelmed. And that's the journey of being human in this work. I think sometimes in community engagement, we go for perfection, right? We've got to get it all exactly right. Actually, it's never going to be exactly right. It's messy, messy work. And so can we hold the tensions of that messiness? Can we make it okay to be uncomfortable and not be perfect and, and value progress over perfection? So let me talk about emotion. Um, other emotions besides discomfort. I like to think that the best definition for emotion is that it is energy in motion. It's the energy conveyed between us in the space between us. So think about all the energy focus from those two sides in Red Rover into the field in the middle. Now we often think about positive or negative emotions, but I don't think that there's positive or negative emotions because actually we require all of the emotions that we experience in order to be fully human. And emotions tell us what we care about, what motivates us, what matters most to us. They connect us to others. They allow us to experience joy and possibility and connection and also the pain and grief of loss. 
Without emotions, we would lack meaning and purpose. So instead of negative and positive, let's think about expansive emotions versus constrictive emotions. So expansive or like heart opening, possible, creative, fun, or heavy, burdensome, stuck, and hard to, to deal with. And the line between expansive and constrictive is courage. Courage is the emotion that allows us to name the hard thing, ask the difficult question, hold the tension of discomfort so we can go deeper. So above the line allows us to solve the problems that we face, build relationships and trust, create possibility. Below the line allows us to understand what is sacred, what we need to protect, where we need to you know, take care of each other, where we are actually right, rather than just committed to being right and making others wrong. Above the line and below the line have got wisdom and insight for us, but the meaning they give us is vastly different. We are, when we are faced with challenges, we come from a distinctly different place, whether we are above the line or whether we are below the line. Now, here's a really tangible tool for, for working with emotion that we actually build our emotional literacy or emotional granularity and we name the emotions. And so the act of naming emotion reduces its intensity and it creates a, an ability to kind of step back from this high arousal state we're in and or the high arousal state someone else is in and allows them to begin to interpret their experience What's going on here? What has meaning for me? What's this emotion pointing me to? So I'm just gonna check the clock. I'm gonna go ahead and take one minute. And I want you to think about what emotions you see in this video. So I'm gonna play one minute of it. So the topic or the context of this video is a, um, a Tucson, New Mexico city council meeting. So a formal public meeting where people get five minutes as a delegation and the topic is sanctuary cities. So as you're watching this, I want you to think about all the emotions you see present in this video and I'll get you to throw them into chat as you see them. We'll just watch one minute of this. City does not change or defy immigration laws. That is Congress's job to change immigration laws. Okay, and that was another five minute delegation. There's a couple of songs actually that happen as five minute delegations. I love this list of emotions that have been put into chat. And the thing I wanna to point to is that all those things are present in our public engagement work, right? Sometimes we focus on that there's just anger, right? Or there's rage or there's frustration, but there's all that stuff. There's joy, there's ridicule, there's contempt, there's, you know, surprise, there's despair, all of that's present. And actually we want to invite all of it in, not just some of it, not just the anger, or the frustration, we need all of it present so that we can work with it effectively. So, and I just want to, you know, give you just a, a this is another quote from my book, but I want to, highlight for you what can happen when we choose the emotion that we're going to work with and we're going to invite into the space. Because when we choose an expansive emotion to meet maybe even a constricting emotion, something shifts. Um, and so that if we choose love, and I know we never talk about leading with love, we all we, we use words like compassion and empathy instead, but actually love is a far more powerful force than fear. It generates hope and possibility and 
fear gives something people to gives people something to be against and love gives people something to be for um i'm going to skip this video and so i just want to leave you with this thought that there are no easy answers or shortcuts but it is possible to cross the divide it is possible to work with complexity to embrace emotion to build community capacity to have these conversations and to build your own competency to do this work and it's going to take all of us to actually reduce polarization and cross the divide so i want to invite you to consider working in this space to meet that call for invitation. If you're interested in reading my book, you can find it on Amazon. If you want to be in conversation about it, you can go to my website and join me for a book club, which there's a number of sessions. And um, I'll, I'll pop a link in for uh, a podcast about um, for the love of community engagement and um, and uh, and you can listen to me talk about my book. And so now let's talk, let's take a couple moments. I know I've only got two minutes left, but if you wanna stay on, I'll stay and answer a couple questions. Who's got a big, juicy, burning question about, about the space, about crossing the divide? I do. Um. I Go was concerned. It. I have a, a client who, you know, has opened up a, a forum so that stakeholders can really be honest and and we we listen and we well document and everything. But their fear is that this raises expectations beyond, you know, that the change will be too big or what have you. And I and I'm I think I don't know how to address that really. So they just need to be this. clear with their expectations. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's almost never my answer, being clear with expectations, because usually that's about our expectations versus, versus the expectations of our participants and our community. And if they're aligned and they're the same, fantastic. But if they're different, that's challenging. So let me ask you this. If what they have invited is a space to tell us all so that they can acknowledge with transparency the challenges that that are are being faced and they can identify then here's what we can do and here's what we can't do, then that's an act of crossing the divide um, and making that really clear. You know, we won't be able to do everything, but we are really interested in understanding your experience and what we need to understand about this, about the situation or the work. If they if they said it that way, then that's helpful. Otherwise, it could just become a dumping ground that could actually escalate and increase the high emotion, and especially if it's online. Um, so I'd encourage you to think about methods or techniques that are designed to, to work with high emotion and create a space where high emotion can be de-escalated and high arousal states are there, even if it's just to gather all the concerns and all the issues that people have. So I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but that's a start to it. I'm gonna go to Morgan and then Steven. And then if you've got another one, pop it into chat too, because I will answer other questions that I don't get to in this session. So Morgan. Great, yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, my question is about what to do in circumstances where a group or uh, several groups who are critical to the really difficult conversation uh, don't want to be part of that conversation. They maybe feel like it will re-traumatize them. Maybe they've been part of similar conversations in the past that didn't result in anything um, meaningful coming out of them. So how do you get someone to come into a conversation that uh, isn't, isn't wanting to because of what has happened in the past? Yeah. Oh, Morgan, that's such, such a good question, right? Because the more um, their experience has been real. I'm sure that there's lots of reasons why they don't trust the organization and they don't want to be in that discussion again and and why they're you know maybe cynical about it. And yet the longer that they're not in the conversation, the bigger the divide gets and the further apart you get. So I'd offer this. Number one is keep creating the space. Keep going to them. Keep just sitting with Empathy, em empathy, practicing deep listening, like Marisol Cantu said so beautifully. Um, keep offering 
um, find perhaps someone in the community who might be willing to be in relationship with you that would be an ambassador or a guide into that community or into that group and um, keep trying. So uh, I have, you know, projects I have worked on over a number of years where in the very first session, you know, we had three people show up and we had people say, no one's ever going to come to this conversation. No one is ever going to talk about this. And then, you know, a couple of years later, we had the entire community in you know the school gym in conversation with us so so it takes time and effort you have to keep creating the space and and you have to absolutely keep acknowledging and owning and apologizing for the past that has happened and and keep you know affirming a commitment to do things differently and in that affirmations demonstrate it just don't just make it words right find some actions that demonstrate what is your organization doing that actually makes it different and let that sort of speak for itself that's a wow that's a big question okay steven and then i see jesse's hand yes hi steph um you mentioned uh feeling challenged when people questioned the the new training that was being developed and so I'm very curious about that. And number one, what, how did you react to being challenged on the process? But also, what's going on? Because I'm the training lead for the Northeast US chapter, and I don't know what's going on. Thank you. Well, yeah, Stephen, that's just like a political landmine you've just thrown to me. So thank you. OK, I'm going to answer things that are in my lane, in my lane. So I, you know, the IP2s can answer about what's happening with the with the training. And I'm, they've got lots of information about that. I'll just answer your question about how did we react? Sometimes, like I said, we reacted with open arms and welcomed, you know, the concern and um, you know, or the ideas or the suggestions because it made it so much richer and better. And sometimes it was challenging, like it felt like personal attack. And I think that's true in every engagement project you've ever worked on, right? You know, something feels like, wow, this is amazing and we should definitely incorporate it. And something feels like, what? I can't believe you just said that to me or about me. And so all of that is true. I, I guess what I would say is we incorporated probably, you know, 80 or 90% of what we heard. And I believe the curriculum probably could, could always continue to be improved, but um, we incorporated as much of it as we could. And I'll leave it to, to the IEP2s to talk about the rest of that. I'll go to, who did I say I was going to? Jesse? That's the hand I can see on my screen right now. Jesse. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Um, I did put my name in for the raffle, so hopefully I get the book. So um, just on the topic of, um, you know, trying to engage with, you know, individuals and groups that may not want to have certain conversations, I think it would be helpful to, to just be cognizant of who they are and how to get a hold of them after, you know, because there's going to be people that we encounter that we're unfamiliar with, you know, like new, new actors, new stakeholders, you know, and knowing who they actually are and how to access them is key because then, you know, then we can follow up um, and try to find those sweet spots um, to, to continue the conversation and to demonstrate um, why we should be having those conversations. So um, yeah, that's what I've noticed. And yeah, um, I, it was more of, of a comment than a question, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. That's that's just beautiful insight and guidance. And thank you so much for sharing it with all of us. I agree wholeheartedly um, with that. We want to be in relationship long term with our communities and our stakeholders, not just for our projects. Right. We need to in order to address the trust deficit, we need to be in long term relationship with the people that we're, we're serving. Susanna, how about this is the last one? Um, and I'll go through the chat. So if you've got questions you think I'm not gonna get to, throw them in the chat and I'll go through the chat and answer more of them. Susanna. Okay, just really quickly, um, I put in the chat asking if you could please put the slide back up, um, the emotions slide. Um, really quickly, and several people have asked, are these, is the recording going to be made available or the slides going to be made available? 
the recording is absolutely going to be made available and it will be posted on, um, I'm just looking for the slide here. It will be posted on both IP2 USA and IP2 Canada. So it'll be there. Here's the slide with the Fantastic. emotions. That's the one you were looking for, Susanna? Thank you so much. And if somebody else has a pressing question for you, uh, please let them use that time if they're still here. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. I'll just leave that up for another second in case you needed a screenshot or something of it. Anybody else? I will take one more. Who is the person who needs to needs to share, needs to ask? Going, going, gone. Ah, oh, David. Oh, go ahead. oh, sorry. Go ahead, David, and then whoever it was can speak. And if you I all just... need, to, the rest of you need to drop off. Go for it and get on with your day, David. Thank you very much. I just put it in the chat, but I thought I'd say it out loud. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what, whether you do anything deliberately and consciously to improve your own practice over time. Wow. Yes, 100%. I, so I set learning goals every year of things I need to stretch into, because even though I've been doing this work for a couple of decades, I, I think you know, it's funny when I started, I think I thought I knew a whole lot more <laughs> than I do now, even though I have learned so much, right? The, and the answers that maybe used to serve me don't necessarily serve me now. So yes, I do. So a couple of years ago, I became a, a certified and trained coach in neurotransformational coaching. So the neuroscience of human development. So I can understand what makes people tick and actually what happens in our brains when we're in these moments and in these conversations. So that's one example. So, um, you know, I, I take lots of courses that are uh, uh, offered through I, the IAP2s as well to grow my practice. And um, I have uh, a very large um, book purchase uh, budget. Um, so I'm always, you know, looking to just extend to, you know, is there another little nugget of wisdom to create the space that for us to have these conversations together. But good, good question, David. And I think we all should do that. You know, it's not a one and done and suddenly you're trained and now you know all the answers. I think you could need to constantly keep learning. So I can see lots of people are just hanging on. So I'll keep going if you wanna stay uh, for a couple yeah, more minutes. I, yeah, Go I appreciate the extra time, Steph. Um, just I put this question in the chat and this might be more of a technical question, but I think um, I'm a consultant in urban planning and I think a lot of what we struggle with is we want to do that deep listening, but we're often constricted by a sense of urgency, which is often arbitrary and sort of controlled by elected officials or budget or, you know, funding and things like that. So my question is like, how do you manage sort of that tension of um, that sense of urgency while and creating that type of deep listening and space for that that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good question, Irene. And to me, it goes to the systems and structures um, that we operate in that actually contribute to polarization. And so there's actually a whole section with like five chapters in my book about the systems and structures that contribute to this, to this space. And so I guess first, what I would say is it's not totally up to you, but it actually starts with you. And having conversations in your organization and with the clients that you work with about the risks of um, not having enough time to build relationships, not taking enough time to build trust, um, not having enough time to really deeply understand what's going on for people like in the Richmond Listening Project, um, because then you will actually not be moving forward and solving the problem. And in lots of cases, you will not be building your project. You will only increase the divide, increase the conflict, and sometimes your project will be shut down. So there's huge risks to not changing the way we do things. But the first place it starts is that conversation about what could go wrong if we don't do something different. And then, like I said at the beginning, right, there's been a million decisions and choices and actions that got us to this place, but a lot of those decisions, choices, and actions, they protect the systems and the structures of decision-making that are not serving us, that are inequitable, and that protect the status quo. Now, that's not a thing 
you know, a hundred public engagement practitioners can change overnight. But if we change the way we work and the way we call people into community, the way we question the timelines, the constraints, the assumptions, the way we focus only on projects instead of better focusing on relationships, and then the project is part of that, then we can start to shift, create a shift because the deficit in trust and the increase in polarization is a risk to humanity. Not said by me, said by the World Economic Forum. So, right, we've got to make some choices someplace to push back a little bit on the assumptions that we make. Sorry, I wish I could give you a much easier answer to that question. It's a good one. But Jesse, is your hand up? Is it a new hand or have you already asked a question? Just can't tell if it's an old hand or a new hand. Okay, must be an old hand. All right, I see that Aaron has lovingly, wonderfully put a whole bunch of questions in and sent them to me. So those are questions that I'm gonna, I'm gonna address um, in follow up. Uh, Okay, well, let me answer one, just one. When is it okay to just walk away? That there are times that whatever we do say is never good enough. And so I guess I would say it's always okay to walk away. Um, and you need to ask yourself, what's your criteria for walking away? Is it about your emotional, mental, or physical safety is at risk? Is it that you actually don't have the capacity to be in service to the people in the conversation or this particular moment in time, right? I talked about despair and burnout over the last decade, right? Needing to step back from these conversations. Um, you know, are you, can you just not be in service? Then that's a good time to walk away because actually what you're gonna bring with you is that despair or frustration and that won't serve the conversation at all. It's really important to, to know what you're committed to. It goes back to those three questions. How do you wanna show up? What are you committed to? And what impact do you wanna have? And depending on what's in you and what's in between the space between you and the other people in the conversation, maybe someone else is better served to lead the conversation. Or maybe it's a good time to take a break. Or as my husband sometimes says, we don't have to talk about everything. Um, but, but there are some things we should talk about. And so, you know, maybe it's about a timing thing too. You know, maybe there's days where this is a great conversation to have. And then there's days where it's, this is not the conversation to have. So it's important that as practitioners, we, we build our own resilience, um, and we take care of ourselves because this is hard work. This is not for the faint of heart. And so I think I'm gonna leave it there. We're 15 minutes over. I promise to answer some of those questions that were left in chat. I'm so grateful for your participation, for your commitment to doing this work, for being you know, present to, to communities and to crossing the divide. Thanks for listening. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Steph, again, for bringing such um, rich content to us today. Um, you know, the, the chat box is just really um, filled with a lot of gratitude and appreciation. And so I think everyone is uh, leaving feeling inspired. And um, so we appreciate um, your commitment, your knowledge, your sponsorship to bring this um, to, to everyone today. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, everyone. Really glad to have been with you.